do, I'd like to uh, invite um, Alice Hammond, who is the program lead for AFA, and Professor Tom Wolfson from Canterbury University to now give us the presentation. difference and where it's most important is right here in communities. So again, thank you, just in case you didn't hear me before. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and listening to this conversation. And we're going to do a presentation and then we're going to have a lot of time for Q&As at the end and we do really invite, um, ask any questions that you have. There are no silly questions when it comes to earthquakes and natural hazards. So it is what we call a boundary organisation. Not only are we dealing with a plate boundary, we are also sitting across many domains of knowledge, including community. Um, and if you wanted to summarise those, research, policy and practice. Again, it's not what the science can tell us to do, it's about how that then affects policy and then what that does look like on the ground in practice. I'm going to hand over to Tom. Okay, good morning, uh, sorry, good afternoon, <laughs> good evening. Hi, so my name's uh, Tom Wilson, so I'm a, a local lab who, who grew up here. Uh, it's really uh, fantastic to be back here at Methuen tonight. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit nervous um, and quite intimidated sitting here in, in Methuen. Not the least because my old geography teacher, Bruce, is here. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm hoping for a, for a strong grade, maybe. <laughs> So, um, so since leaving Methuen, um, I went on to University of Canterbury, did a degree uh, in Geology and Geography, and then went on and did a PhD with GNS and, and Massey and, and other training places, and, and really got interested in the impacts of natural hazards on society. And I, I really focused a lot on farming, and then kind of got into crit critical infrastructure and, and that sort of thing. 
Um, I got appointed to the University of Canterbury in 2009 as an academic, really lucky, just right place, right time, and then of course the Canterbury earthquake sequence started. So I sort of did a bit of a pivot from being quite interested in volcanoes and then really got into earthquakes over the last, and, and have stayed in there for the last 10 years. So as Alice said, I've been really fortunate to be part of um, the AF8 team for the last five or so years and uh, have been leading some of the research that's, um, uh, that we'll share with you tonight. Can everyone hear me okay? Dad, can you hear me? Or you should be <laughs> the family support here. Okay, so what I'm going to go through, and I apologise the slides are a bit small, so don't stress if you can't read all of them, I'll, I'll try and talk through most of it. Um, what I'm going to go through over the next couple of slides is how do we characterise earthquakes from a scientific perspective? And, and what do you need to know, especially here in, in Ethelon or in mid Canterbury? So the first thing that we want to look at is the magnitude. So how much energy might be released in a future Alpine Fault earthquake? And how, how do we calculate that? Then the next one, which I think is some of the most compelling information, is what's the likelihood of a future event? And there's some superb science that we'll share with that. But then we'll get into things which are actually useful for you guys in terms of what might be the hazard footprint or the spatial extent of the, uh, the future event and, um, and what that intensity might look like. So what's the shaking that we might experience here in Methven or in Ashburton or, or wherever it might be. And those are the sorts of things that we can use for, for planning for what, what we might design our buildings towards or, or have our farms protected against. But what I really want to focus on towards the end of the talk is the useful stuff, in my opinion. So really thinking around what might be some of the consequences of an event like this and how can you take charge and, and reduce some of that risk or, or what some of those consequences might be. So the sort of concepts that I am spend my life thinking about, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, is, is this, this notion behind me here, where out on the, the, your, your left hand side, we're thinking about hazard. So these are phenomena that can affect society or cause harm. So earthquakes, tsunami, volcanoes, that sort of thing. And then out on the right hand side, we've got what's exposed. So what societal elements might be there. So it could be your buildings, could be your cultural assets, could be your peoples, uh, society, economy, and so on. And then we relate the two together through this concept of vulnerability. And I really like using the, the three piggies and the, and the big bad wolf as an analogy for that. So you've got the big bad wolf, so he or she will be trying to blow the house down, so that's the hazard, the, the breath. But those three houses are made of different things. So they have different vulnerability attributes. So they're going to be able to resist that hazard in different ways. So if it's out of sticks or, or stones or or, um, uh, or wood, they're going to have a different performance with what that big bad wolf's going to be able to do to it. So from that we can calculate the impact, and if we have a probability, then we have risk. So let's start with how do we look at what the energy might be for an Alpine Fault um, earthquake. I'm just going to move this back so I can see what the slides are doing. There we go. Okay, so the, the Alpine Fault was first sort of discovered, so to speak, by science about 50 or so years ago. And the way they picked it out was that there was this big long spine running along the Southern Alps where they were able to see quite a clear lineation along them. But the more compelling piece of evidence, and when they started to realise that it was earthquakes that were, that were moving these plates around, was that the rocks down in central Otago are pretty much, well are the same as some of the rocks up in northwest Nelson. And they've simply been displaced by the plates moving past each other. And the way they move past each other is through the form of big earthquakes on the Alpine Fault. So we can inform from that that there's been millions of years of earthquakes on this fault line, because um, it's taken that long for those rocks to be displaced uh, by that much. We know across the southern, uh, the South Island, sorry, just checking what's up on the screen. So we have the two tectonic plates that meet here in the South Island um, then the Pacific Plate and the Australian Plate, and they're not hitting against each other like this, but rather they're grinding past each other, almost sort of at a bleak angle, around about 35 millimetres per year. Most of that stress and strain that's built up there is taken up by the Alpine Fault, about 70% of it. The other 30 odd percent is taken up by the other faults, such as Porter's Pass, Hope Fault, and all those faults that ruptured in the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, and even the Greendale Fault and the Christchurch Faults that ruptured back in 2010 and 2011. 
So when you think about it, there's been all that activity, um, but that's all from about 30% of the, the relative plate motion that's happening there. The rest of it's all taken up, we think, by the Alpine Fault, about 70% of it. So when we have an Alpine Fault earthquake, um, it, we know that they, they move, the plates move past each other laterally, out to sort of three to four meters, sometimes a bit more, but they also, the Pacific plate gets popped up a little bit, and that's why we have the Southern Alps. And they, they pop up at around about, on average, about 10 millimeters per year is the, the cumulative average there. So the way that I wanna describe then how we start to pick up what, how much energy might be released with a future Alpine fault earthquake, is if you can bear with me, put your hands together, really tight and really give them a good squeeze and then move them like that and what you should be experiencing is heat being released so we've got that energy being being produced so it's the exact same process as what happens in an earthquake you've got two fault planes or the palm of your hand is a fault plane and it's moving so when we have a magnitude 5 earthquake the palm of your hand is about the size of the central business district of Christchurch, or the four avenues of Christchurch. And it's moving about 10 centimetres. So think of it that much moving, that's about a magnitude five earthquake. When we go up to a magnitude seven earthquake, something like the Darfield earthquake back in September 2010, you're looking at two Christchurch urban areas being the size of the palm of your hand, moving about two to three metres. So that's a magnitude seven. And then we have the good stuff, oh, we go up to a magnitude eight, and that's about 10,000 square kilometers of the, the palm of your hand. That's the fault plane that's, that's moving up to about five to, to six meters. And that's what we expect an Alpine fault earthquake to look like. And you might say, well, Tom, that's all very well. How do you know that? Well, we look at where has it ruptured in the past? So much of geology, the, you know, the key to understanding the future is looking into the past. So when we look at the Alpine Fault, we can see certainly the last um, five to 10 earthquakes that have occurred along that fault line appear to have been full fault ruptures. And what I mean by that is the whole length, or much of the whole length of the, uh, the Alpine Fault from all the way down in Fiordland, all the way up to sort of Northwest Nelson, seems to be rupturing for about 400 kilometers worth. And that's how we can calculate that we think the future, uh, or very likely the future Alpine Fault earthquake is likely to be a magnitude eight earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, I just can't quite see what I wanted to say there, sorry. Oh, no. So the, a, a point here is there's enough stored energy when we're looking at moving those, uh, uh, when that fault uh, plane eruptions, as we're looking at up to eight meters of lateral or horizontal mm -hmm. um, displacement along the fault and up to two to three, maybe four metres of vertical displacement. Who amongst us has driven through or been to Franz Joseph? You know that little terrace that's just beside the petrol station? You know it's about two to three metres high? Guess what that is? It's that 1717 rupture of the Alpine Fault. So probably in the, in, back in 1717 when the Alpine Fault last ruptured, there would have been about eight metres of horizontal displacement there, and then what we're seeing today, that little fault scarp or little terrace, is the vertical component. So it gives us a sense of, of how recent these things are and, and how, much, how much violence there is with um, some of these, these events. But this one here, and forgive me for the, this plot, I'll, I'll talk you through it as best I can, but I think this is some of the most compelling evidence of why we should prepare for an Alpine fault earthquake. So what this plot here is showing is on the right hand side is the year 2000. And then as we go back in time, 8,000 years, back to about 6,000 AD, we've got, um, so that's the time axis on the horizontal axis. What those little squiddly plot things are is histograms or, or little plots of, of data of radiocarbon dates. Now what a bunch of crazy geologists have done dug around in the deep dark fields of Fiordland and, and southern Westland and looked at areas where the Alpine Fault meets a watercourse or a swamp and when it displaces there's enough sedimentation and, and disturbance is that some of the organic content, the organic carbon, gets captured under a gravel layer or some other sort of lens where you, it traps that carbon. And if you go to the right spots, 
as you see where those faults are um, progressively working through, you can go back and date each individual earthquake. And what we've got here is the last 27 events on the Alpine Fault. It's an absolutely superb world-class data set and massive kudos to GNS Science, University of Otago and uh, Victoria um, Wellington University. Sorry, I mixed all that up, but anyway, we're in the South Island, it doesn't matter. The, um, what those scientists have managed to do is pull all that information together and we can start to get an understanding of what the recurrence or what the type of earthquakes that we see uh, through time or how, what their spacing might look like. So of those 27 earthquakes over the last 8,000 years, we can see on the plot that they're very regular through time. So whilst there's a little bit of variance in terms of the, the radiocarbon age dates, they're largely in a very regular sequence. And that, that would tell us that this is a very mature fault. It's, it's sort of, this is probably not appropriate, but anyway, it's sort of all oiled up and she's, she's well lubricated. She's been, um, uh, that fault's been working for a number of millions of years, so it's quite mature in terms of its seismic cycle. The longest interval between uh, the median age dates of those um, uh, uh, earthquake events is about 700 years, and the shortest is about 140 years. But what's probably most compelling is if when we look across all of that data, which again, I want to stress, this is absolutely world-class data, you really just don't get this many anywhere else, is that the average recurrence interval, or the, the average time between um, these rupture earthquake events, is about 300 years. And we're quite confident that the last earthquake on the Alpine Fault was in 1717 AD. So about 304 years ago. So what that tells us is that we're probably fairly far along the seismic cycle of, of this, this particular fault. So if you like, the, the spring is, is starting to wind and is, is really starting to get under tension. So it doesn't mean that we're going to have the earthquake tomorrow, but it just means that as every day goes on, the probability of it occurring increases. So for those of you amongst us uh, that are interested in probabilities, such as BD, over the next 50 years, the conditional probability of an earthquake occurring is about 30%, which is very high for a fault like this. And some of the new um, science data that's coming out of the northern part of the Alpine Valley suggests that that probability might even be a bit higher. So it, watch the newspapers for that, because there'll be some announcements on that soon. So what we can say is, for most of us in this room, we're a pretty good chance that we'll see an Alpine Fault earthquake in our, in our lifetime. So it's something we should prepare for. Now, the next piece of good news is the shaking intensity. So this is, what I'm showing here is a simple, it's called an isoseismal plot. So it's basically areas of equal shaking intensity. So areas that are red are very extreme violent shaking. It's where we would expect non-engineered buildings to collapse. So uh, as I understand it, the hall here was, um, has been recently retrofitted, which is superb. Um, but if, if this hall was located right beside the Alpine Fault, um, and we had an earthquake um, before it was retrofitted, um, we would expect to see serious structural damage or perhaps even collapse. Um, so just to give you a sense of, of what we're dealing with here. As we move away from the, the Alpine Fault and out towards Canterbury, and, and you might track across more to Christchurch, we can see that shaking intensity forecast drops away to something a bit more manageable. But just for reference, those are the exact, the, the, the plots that I've just brought up there on the left-hand side, are the isoseismal plots for the Darfield earthquake from 2010. And many of you will probably remember the shake that that gave us here. And then the one at the bottom is the Christchurch earthquake from February the 22nd, 2011. So they're to the same scale. So the take home from this plot is that a future Alpine Fault earthquake will be a South Island wide event. Everybody will feel it. Auckland will feel it. They will have a good shake. Sydney will probably feel it. So it'll be a good earthquake. But where things, where things get like really cool, from my world at least, <laughs> um, is there's some really exciting science that's, that's starting to come through to help um, with making decisions around how we can try and reduce the risk. So what we have here is I'm going to show you what's called a physics-based um, int shaking intensity model. So it's run on a supercomputer at the University of Canterbury. It's been led by Professor Brendan Bradley out of the Civil Engineering Department there. 
So before I let it loose, what, what you're going to see is a, a visualisation of the shape and intensity of an alpine fog earthquake occurring running from south to north up the island. So I'll just let it run and then I'll run it again because it's, it's worth watching a couple of times. So I'll just I'll narrate this a little bit. So the, the earthquakes began down in Fjordland. Um, don't worry, this is dramatically exaggerated in terms of what we're not going to see the southern Alps going up in high. <laughs> what you're seeing here is an, um, a visualization of the shaking intensity, or we call it the, the peak ground velocity, of how, how quickly is the ground moving. So at the moment, the waves are mostly working through hard rock. So the schists and gneisses um, in Fjordland starting to get up into some of the grey wackies of, of almost southern parts of, of Canterbury. But what I want you to watch is what happens when the seismic waves enter into the big sloppy basin that is Canterbury. Now if you think Canterbury is impressive, watch Christchurch. So just for reference, the earthquake's still rupturing, still, still rupturing here, we're two and a half minutes in. Look at Christchurch, oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's that basin effect, I'll, I'll talk through that in a little bit. Earthquake's still going, so we're about three minutes now, and what you're seeing is that big wave train um, uh, now heading for, sort of getting to Nelson, Blenheim, and off to give uh, Wellington the good news as it moves forward. So the rupture's finished now, it's probably about three, three and a half minutes of, of rupture time along a 400 kilometre fault. So I'll run that again, because it's, it's a good one to... So just before I get going, it's worth thinking, the way that this model works is that every little bit of geology is modelled within here. So we're looking at what type of substrate, or what rock, or gravel, or sand and silt is there, and how much water might be in it. And lots, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions, but it's a superb piece of scientific work by, by Brendan and his team. And it gives us extremely accurate um, representations of, of what we might experience. So what we're seeing there is the, the ruptures occurring. So what's actually happening is as the earthquake or the fault is rupturing, it's rupturing at about the same speed or velocity as which the seismic waves are moving away or trying to radiate out. So it stacks up the energy. And so we have, um, as that wave train is moving north, you're getting more and more energy coming into it. Now, as it enters into Canterbury, because we're in that softer sedimentary basin, and it's quite sloppy, so to speak, here in Canterbury, uh, at least from a geological sense, is that it slows down the energy a bit. And so it intends to amplify the waves. So we get slightly higher shaking here in the, those sedimentary basins. But look at Christchurch. What a terrible place to build a city from an earthquake perspective. <laughs> so that's those the swampy, peaty areas um, that are all liquefying and whatnot. And then you can see that energy moving forward north um, onto the lower part of the North Island. Can we just go on to Wellington? Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> so, what that means is. <laughs> So in terms of a model like that, it gives us a much more accurate representation of what we might experience here in Canterbury. So with a south to north rupture scenario, and I must stress, we don't know if that's what's going to happen in a future event. It could be north to south, it could be from the centre and going out in a, what's called a unilateral rupture. We just don't know. But we plan for a south to north rupture because it's probably the most impactful for New Zealand. So with that scenario in mind, when you look at through uh, mid-Canterbury there, and if we locate ourselves, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but here in Methven, we're in a level of shaking intensity which would give us a really good shake, but most of our timber-framed, light-roofed houses, you'd move around, have a little bit of structural damage, maybe you have your gypped, um, chipped a little bit, but you're probably mostly okay. It's the things like your unsecured um, chimneys, if you've got masonry that hasn't been tied down, if you've got hot water cylinders that aren't, aren't well secured, that's the type of stuff that you want to get onto now. In terms of your farming infrastructure, thinking about your um, irrigation, water supplies, all of that sort of thing, that, those were what tended to come up with the Darfield earthquake and the Hiranui um, Kaikoura earthquake in 2016. 
So keep those types of things in mind. But the thing that I'd, I'd also stress is this is a South Island wide event. Mid Canterbury mostly will probably be okay relative to other communities. So it may be that a lot of aid and other resources get prioritised elsewhere. So it may be even if we're not that affected, it might be that you're not going to get those supply chains that you're reliant on or thinking that will come through. So remember, we're part of a bigger community here. News gets better. So it's not just the ground shaking that we want to worry about. In developed nations, especially places like New Zealand, we've got very good building codes, which generally work very well. We're even getting better, at least, at land use planning and not building on top of faults and things like that. But what's very hard to manage, and what we haven't done a lot of work on necessarily here in New Zealand, is the secondary hazards. So the landslides, the liquefaction, the tsunami, uh, those things that can be triggered by an earthquake. And so we have that cascading effect where we might have the earthquake in a mountainous area leading to landslides, which can dam rivers, and then if we, in some instances, we can have a, a catastrophic breakout uh, flood. So we've seen that happen up in North Canterbury following the Kaikoura Huranui um, earthquake. These are the types of things which will be challenging on the west and eastern sides of the Southern Alps. We will have literally tens of thousands of landslides. They will block roads. There will be communities isolated. Some of you may need to evacuate if you're in areas that may be downstream uh, of, of some of those rivers that could be blocked. So they, these are challenging um, issues and there'll be high priorities for ECAN and, and uh, other agencies to get stuck into immediately after an event like this. Um, the, sorry, I'm just trying to remember what comes next. Oh, there we go. So the, um, the thing that's, I think, also worth keeping in mind is sometimes it's these secondary hazards which cause the greatest impact. So if we think to the Christchurch earthquake, whilst it was really scary with the ground shaking and, and we did have some tragic building collapses, what really caught the nation out was the liquefaction problem. That, all, that really tested us financially and in terms of being able to house um, the people that were displaced due to the liquefaction ground damage. If we think of the Kaikoura Huranui earthquake, the landsliding that occurred in widespread areas, both rural and on that coastal transportation stretch, that really tested us and was a real challenge to manage. If we look around the world, there's numerous examples around tsunami and so on, that those secondary hazards are often the most challenging. So it's well worth keeping them in mind. So we've tried to do a lot of work within AFA secondary hazards. And what we're seeing here is a, a landslide susceptibility model, which is an estimate of where landsliding is most likely to occur after an earthquake on the Alpine Fault. And so, unsurprising to most, I'm sure, is that very high probabilities of landsliding close to where the, the highest shaking intensities are, but it becomes really useful when we overlay that with our state highway networks or other transport or critical infrastructure networks when we're thinking about what might happen there. And we've calibrated a lot of this work following the, the Kaikoura Huranui um, earthquake, where it was a, um, in many ways a, a superb case study for an Alpine Fault earthquake. We've got a lot better at a national level around trying to identify and forecast where liquefaction may occur. So we've got examples here of a uh, liquefaction susceptibility model, again, which can, can help us um, with some of our designing and planning. And one thing which is really worth keeping in mind is after a very large earthquake like a magnitude 8, is we're likely to have months, if not years, of aftershocks afterwards. And so those aftershocks can be very, very difficult to forecast, forecast where they will be, but it's very, we're almost certain that we know that they'll be coming. And it tends to be at the tips of the fault where it's ruptured. So down in the south and, and up in the north is likely to be where there's concentrations of them, but it doesn't mean to say that other uh, faults that are closer to us here in Methven might not also rupture because of the changed stress field that's been um, moved around due to this, this earthquake event. So, all things to keep in mind. Uh, I might just skip that slide for the sake of time. So, one of the things that we've been um, working very closely with, uh, with AF8 has been working and really doing a lot of uh, activity around, is with our critical infrastructure operators or lifeline organisations. So, in particular, um, NZTA and a lot of the councils that have um, roading networks exposed in areas that could be affected, there's been a huge amount of work going into thinking about um, what are the likely impacts and where disruptions might occur 
but also what restoration priorities could be and how we might start to see things come back up online, which is, uh, I guess, certainly really important in terms of that sort of strategic um, planning picture. It's also triggered a huge amount of resilience thinking, for lack of a better word. So there's been a lot of business cases going in around thinking of how can we strengthen these critical infrastructure um, networks and components and, and sites so that they will perform better and will be hardened or, or uh, more likely to perform well after an earthquake of this size. And I really commend um, Waka Katane or NZTA uh, around a lot of that work. They've really been leading a lot of this stuff, especially around their bridge uh, resilience program. But if we look and drill down into our state highway networks here, for those of you with good eyesight, you'll see that there's a lot of those alpine passes are really likely to be seriously affected by landslides. So a high priority, which is fairly obvious, is that the west coast is very likely to be isolated after an event like this. So again, whilst we might be around here, there's likely to be communities elsewhere that need a lot of assistance. So, um, and into the foothills of Canterbury and, and beyond, again, those communities may have some challenges there in terms of being isolated or needing additional support. One of the things that uh, we've been involved with quite a lot is thinking around this restoration priority. Apologies, again, this, this map will be very difficult to see, but for those of you that can see, there's um, the five maps here, and what they're showing is time slices after an Alpine Fold earthquake of what the restoration of the state highway network might look like. So we've got time uh, day one, uh, one week, one month, six months, and beyond six months are those, those maps. And if you can see it, what it's showing is that much of the West Coast is unlikely to be restored uh, within six months of an event like this, especially places like Haast Pass and potentially Arthur's Pass as well. It may just be too much, or it may be very difficult without um, considerable investment. If we think of what happened with State Highway 1 um, on the, uh, close to Kaikoura with the NICTA program or the North Canterbury uh, infrastructure repair program there. I mean, they, they were a good year before they got things really opened up and moving. And if you can think, they've only got one slope contributing. In some of those big valleys, there'll be both, both sides um, contributing landslides. That was also State Highway 1, a really key strategic um, route for the nation. Is State Highway 6 in the same class? I don't know. In terms of our electricity networks, this is a really interesting one. So the TransPower network in general performed very, very well um, during all of the major earthquakes that we've had over the last decade. There's been a lot of strengthening that they've put into things. Where things got more challenging is where there was liquefaction and substations and whatnot sort of slipped away and, and sheared off um, with their connections at a distribution level. But certainly with the Kaikoura earthquake, there was very good performance with a lot of the pylons um, uh, having a big shake, but, but no major um, challenges for them. So the, the thinking is that much of the um, power grid, or the transmission grid at least, so that high voltage electricity, might be pretty good, at least on the east coast, um, for uh, in the aftermath of an event like this. The challenge, of course, will be those pylons and, and lines going through to the west coast, which will be highly exposed to landsliding. But the big question, and there's been some work done on it, but the big question is how will our big generation assets perform? So we've got some quite old dams, quite well maintained, but, but old, and they are likely to have a really good shake. So whilst the companies uh, that operate them have been preparing for events like this, there's always something often that comes up, and it, it can be unexpected or, or something odd may occur. So the assumption is that electricity is likely to be restored across the South Island within days, if not hours, provided that the generators come through okay those generators will shut down for at least a couple of hours for checks and, and so on. The additional component with many of our hydro stations is of course their big lakes are surrounded by quite steep hills and so we've got landsliding into them which can create seiches or, or lake tsunami. Um, that of course can also create some challenges so there's, there's a few things just to keep in mind with that. Just for the sake of time, I won't go through the restoration priorities there but it does exist. Um, the telecommunication networks, um, again, many are sort of a not quite isolated places, so could be affected, but um, the, one of the big interdependencies, I guess, is uh, their reliance on electricity. 
So whilst there's been a lot of resilience initiatives, especially in the aftermath of snowstorms, to get those rural exchanges working and, and can char be charged up by, by other users, um, that's also expected to be a, a, a potential challenge. So the restoration of, of uh, infrastructure networks, gosh, I apologise, this, this text is quite small. I'm just going to have to have a quick look to remind me what was there. <laughs> okay, so the... Whilst the, the restoration of those big uh, infrastructure networks will of course be a priority, just do keep in mind that it will be, it'll be really tricky for some of those repair crews if those aftershocks go on, more landslides come, what if we have a big weather event in the middle of it all and more debris comes down? So again, whilst here in the, in the wonderful Canterbury Plains, we're probably quite resilient. Um, we're not really exposed to a lot of landslides or anything like that. We may have a bit of settlement from some of our approaches to bridges and things like that. Again, we can bulldoze gravel in there pretty easily. It might be some of those other communities that we are close to or across on the west coast that, that really need the, the highest priority. Don't worry about that, that's just a bit of stuff. What the, um, one graphic that I quite like to show, just as a, um, a way to think about the importance of interdependence of our infrastructure networks, is this is a model that looks at the number of critical infrastructure networks that will be disrupted after an alpine fault event, and then as they come back up online. So what you're seeing on the, um, on the left hand side is the first zero to three days. We're seeing all 13 of, of those critical infrastructure networks probably down with some level of disruption in those first couple of days. So we want to be able to, to carry on ourselves without, oops, Let's move them before I break. As we move across to seven days and into 30 days, we slowly start to see our infrastructure networks starting to come back up online. And then by after about six months or 180 days, we've still got much of the west coast affected by some of our infrastructure networks being down. And that's mostly driven by the road network, not likely to be as functional as we would uh, normally have it. Whilst there's a lot of assumption in this model, it just gives us a picture of how interconnected these networks can be, and as that restoration comes back up, it can be a bit slower than perhaps what we would all, all desire. And again, look towards North Canterbury for some of the examples after the um, Kaikoura Hurului um, earthquake as an example there. Um, an important point for rural communities in New Zealand is thinking about what the casualty and welfare impacts potentially could be. So whilst many of our urban centres have put a high priority on uh, removing some of our earthquake prone buildings and, and other areas um, uh, and other structures which can cause problems, many of our uh, smaller rural communities still struggle with that really difficult challenge of having earthquake prone buildings which could cause fatalities or at least casualties when an earthquake like this stri strikes. Um, it's a really tricky problem, balancing those, the, the heritage values and, and all the other um, uh, challenges there. But when we do run casualty models, and, and all I can tell you is, is the honest um, results, is that they, the earthquake prone buildings in many of our rural towns um, are a big contributor to, to fatalities and severe injuries when we're looking at, at uh, potential casualty models for this type of work. And I think the, the examples of which um, are clear from the likes of Christchurch um, where many of those, those buildings which were um, perhaps not to the standard that we hoped they would be or, or, or uh, desired them to be were, were the ones that did a lot of the, um, lot of the harm. Okay, cool, just checking with that. Um, so one of the areas that we, we have a lot of power in our own um, capacity to do is to influence what those likely impacts um, will potentially be. Sorry, I apologise again, the text is so small. But the, one of the big determinants of the likely casualties and other welfare impacts will be the time of day that an earthquake occurs. Um, so for instance, uh, if we have an earthquake at about 4 a.m., that would be about ideal. Everyone's at home in their very usually very resilient houses, they're in their beds, and the key thing, stay in your beds. Don't jump out. That's one of the biggest claims for ACC injuries in the aftermath of an earthquake, is an action injury of people jumping out of their bed, hitting their head in something, tripping on some broken glass, or, or doing something like that. So the message is stay in your bed, ride it out as best you can, and then take a breath, and then see, just see what you're jumping onto as you jump out of bed. 
It's, I know it's scary, but uh, you take nothing else away from this talk, stay in here. <laughs> the worst time of day for an event to happen um, is when there's lots and lots of people in um, uh, urban or sort of small urban areas clustered around buildings which, which could potentially collapse and cause major fatalities. Or if we've got lots of, um, for example, tour buses or whatever on landslide prone roads. That's where, we, um, where some of the concerns do lie. That time of day, time of year, time of season, even day of the week, um, are all factors which make it really difficult to, to robustly forecast what the potential impacts to us as people will be. But the thing that we have in our power is knowing what to do. So drop, cover, hold, or if you're in your bed, you're already there, just hang on tight. <laughs> Stay there. But look, just look out to protecting yourself, making sure that your friends and family know what to do. That's, that's one of the things that can really make a big difference in terms of injuries and even fatalities. And one of the things I, I'm just going to add in here is we've done some work around habitability. So how many houses will be habitable after a big event like this? This is something that the, the district health boards found really, really useful. So again, it's just a model and that, as the old saying goes, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And in this case, there's some, perhaps some use in this model where it's perhaps worth looking at the scale of, of how many people will be affected by an event like this, but also what the good news stories are. So whilst out on the west coast, we're likely to see, um, well, potentially a lot of uh, displaced people or, or people in affected um, housing, which may have loss of essential services and so on. If we look at Canterbury, which is the great big pie on the bottom right there, is that the vast majority of Canterbury should be pretty good, with really no effect, so that's in the yellow there. And just a small sliver, probably more towards the western side of the, of the region, um, having some challenges around minor disruption to, to housing. But it's models like that, I guess, that just give us a little bit of a sense of, of what, the, um, what the issues might be. It's also quite nice to show something like this when we're talking to a Canterbury-based audience, is that we're actually, because it's been a lot of doom and gloom, it might actually be not too bad, as long as, you know, keep those chimneys um, secured and um, drop cover hold or, or stay in bed, as the case may be. Um, I appreciate I've, I've been banging on here for a while, but my, this is my second to last slide. I just wanted to share some of the lessons for rural communities that we've had from particularly the Kaikoura Hurunui earthquake. And I, I was up on a fed farmer's um, field trip or field day um, the week before uh, in the high country talking about some of these issues. And it was a really good discussion with some of the, some of the cockies up there around what some of the um, things that you can do to prepare on farm or in, in rural uh, and isolated areas. And I think one of the, the big lessons that really came out of the, the North Canterbury and Southern Marlborough experience was, was your water supplies. So even if you've got really great, you know, great big tanks um, with lots of supply for your home or, or for, your, um, for your farm, sometimes the shaking can be so violent that those, those connections can shear off. And I can't tell you how many people I spoke to up in um, the Lees Valley that, that had thought they had secure water supplies, but the, the connection sheared off and all their water drained away within a couple of hours. Uh, and then went up to check and they're like, oh, no, we've lost our water. So again, thinking about that's really critical, and especially here in Mid-Canterbury where we've got such reliance on, on those water supplies. The other big one, of course, is energy. So both in terms of backup power supplies. So all you dairy cockies out there, I really hope you've got your, your generators for your, your dairy sheds. Absolutely essential. Really, really clear resilience lesson from North Canterbury earthquake events, and even as far back as Darfield. Anyone that had a generator usually came through pretty well. The other side is, is have good fuel supplies for your vehicles and, and any other machinery that requires fuel or you know, petrol or diesel. Again, a really strong lesson. Um, one which, which may not necessarily be um, a clear one uh, to think of, but Dad actually reminded me as, I was driving, as we were driving down here today, um, having a front end loader tractor. Um, the number of North Canterbury farmers that reported that was useful for clearing up landslides or um, just getting tracks going again, even sorting out your fences, that sort of thing, was, was really, again, a clear, really good, clear lesson. Um, one of the, and it'd be great to have James's perspective on this, of, I, I think, whilst the messaging from civil defence nationally is often have enough water and supplies for two to three days, I would challenge rural communities to have enough for two to three weeks. Here, in, there's the potential that our roading networks are going to be compromised. If we're in isolated areas, we may not see people for a while. And it's a little bit like the snowstorms that I remember growing up with here, where you could be cut off for, for days to weeks at a time. So being self-sufficient um, for that period of time is something that may be worth considering. 
The other one, I guess, from a business perspective, as, as our agribusiness and, and tourism um, activities become increasingly connected, um, both from a local and through global scales, is that those supply chains can very quickly dry up. And you know, it's no better case study that we're living through at the moment with COVID. But uh, the knocking out those logistics chains, um, uh, I'm not sure if many people were aware, but Christchurch went very close to, to running out of food uh, after the Christchurch earthquake, when we lost our fast-moving consumer good warehouses. I think Blenheim was within hours of running out of, of you know, seriously running out of food um, after the Kaikoura earthquake with the inability to get fast moving consumer goods back in there. So some of these challenges will be significant. One thing that really stresses me out is, is um, South Westland, where they just don't have um, big supplies of food, at least in some of the stores, where uh, the Foursquare in Franz Josef, I think, is supplied on a daily basis. And they're, just, they're just trucking it in in, in high touristic seasons. So it's, these are some of the, the challenges that, that will be in play. And I think a, a final thought is, and again, I guess it's a big lesson from the Hiranui of, um, this, this will be a challenging event, certainly not trying to dress it up any other way, but what if it came in after two years of heavy drought, or after some other major, you know, series of big snowstorms, and, and farms were stressed or, or whatever. So thinking around some of those compounding issues, but what some of those resilience activities can be would be, um, is well worth considering. I think a strong lesson out of North Canterbury was a lot of the drought committees formed really effective earthquake committees um, in the aftermath of those events, keeping connected. Okay, so the last message is from me, and again, apologies, I'm going to go back and forth because I should have these memorised. Right, so the, hopefully the take home from this, especially with some of that awesome data that the, the geologists have come up with, is the next, or the future Alpine Fault earthquake is inevitable. And it's likely many of us will see it in our lifetimes, or at least we have a very high probability that we will. So any preparations that we can do will be valuable. Um, we've presented to you tonight a, one potential scenario. It's almost inevitable that a future earthquake will be different from what we've presented to you um, here. But at least you've got a bit of a taster of what it might potentially look like. And hopefully, or I can see actually, it's been a wonderful engagement. Dad's still awake, so that's a win. And, I can see people thinking, even BD's nodding, so that's, that's a good sign. <laughs> um, I think some of the stuff that we really, and again, I feel like many people have got this pretty well down, but those secondary hazards, the landslides, the liquefaction, that sort of thing, those will be really challenging. And it, they're not just going to be something we can sort out in a day or two. That'll be months to potentially years after an event like this. So um, anything that we can do now to prepare for that, and so you as voters have power with that. Um, communication, of course, is key, but building those, those networks in our communities is really essential. It'll be your neighbours that'll come and help you out, friends and family. It's not going to be the, um, the, the emergency services or civil defence and so on. They'll be completely swamped. There's, there's honestly not that many of them. People like James are, are really precious, <laughs> few and far between. So invest in each other, and it's, that becomes a really, um, a really clear lesson from the last decade of experiences we've had here in New Zealand and, and of course, from around the world. So this final slide here, Alice, did you want to sweep in and yeah. have a different voice doing this? Because it might be my third people might be sick of me. I'll finish right here and I'll come back for questions. Thanks, Tom. And yeah, we will go on to questions just shortly. And I think uh, these are just some of the points you might like to take away with you on how we can prepare. Like Tom's illustrated, we can't predict earthquakes. Science is not that advanced, but the next Alpine Fault earthquake is inevitable and there's a lot we can do to be better prepared for that. Um, I'm not going to speak to all of them, there's some of the, the points are also on this banner here and you can find a lot of information through the uh, uh, pamphlets and flyers that are around the room tonight as well. One of the key messages though that I would like to sort of end on is that you don't have to do it alone. So being prepared for two to three weeks, I think the slide behind me says at least seven days, some people say three days, you know, sometimes that's not feasible when we've got life to get on with in the meantime. Um, but that real message about coming together before something happens is really what we're trying to get, get through today, is Kiwis are so great at coming together after an event. We've seen that time and time and time again. Um, and what we'd encourage you to do is to start having these conversations before the event, when it's a bit easier, a bit more comfortable, a little less, a little less hectic, and 
we can all be better prepared for the next Alpine Fall earthquake. So thanks again so much for coming tonight and I think we'll just open up for questions now.